So welcome everyone to Come Follow Me Isaiah. I'm Jocelyn Peterson. I have the Teachings of Jesus Christ page and YouTube channel. And I'm very lucky to be able to work with these two gentlemen on creating new content that will hopefully help Isaiah to reach a broader audience. So with me, we have Abraham Gileadi, the man who needs no introduction. Hopefully you've been following us and, and you know who he is. But we also have Cameron Mayer. So Cameron, can you tell us a little bit about yourself as well? Oh, thank you. I don't think there's too much to tell. Um, I'm a, a student of Isaiah, a student of the scriptures. Um, I uh, graduated from BYU earlier this year and currently out in St. Louis uh, doing some work in marketing. So, Excellent. Well, I know your contributions to the Isaiah Institute are a lot. So thank you for everything that you do as well. May, and, may I interject a moment and, and, yeah. and mention that Cameron does a weekly newsletter and does a wonderful job of it. So yeah. on isaiahinstitute.com. Thanks, Cameron. Yeah, so be sure to check that out if you haven't. So today we're going to be going through Isaiah 50 through 57 or thereabouts. And the theme that we've pulled from these chapters really is this theme of the restoration of Israel. And just to start us off, uh, I do have this quote from President Nelson that I just loved. And he said, if you think the church has been fully restored, you're just seeing the beginning. There is much more to come. Wait till next year. And then the next year, eat your vitamin pills, get your rest. It's going to be exciting. And that is what I get when I read Isaiah. <laughs> there is so much to come. And he's really the prophet who lays this all out. And it, and it really starts... I would say the most important part probably of this whole restoration process is the salvation um, and the restoration that comes through our relationship with Jehovah or Jesus Christ. So let's start off in Isaiah 53, four through six. Um, Abraham, would you like to get us started by reading and discussing these verses? Yeah, this is Isaiah 53 is really the scripture, the prophecy, the major prophecy all the scripture on the savior and his atonement. And Isaiah 53, one through 10, we don't have time here to read it all, but here this gives you a little synopsis of the whole thing. He bore our sufferings, endured our griefs, though we thought him stricken, smitten of God and humbled. And notice it's us speaking as people, including the Jews and the 10 tribes and the Lamanites, all of it the ethnic lineages of Israel and the Gentiles, but he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities, the price of our peace he incurred, and with his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep had gone astray, each of us headed his own way. The Lord brought together upon him the iniquity of us all. The thing that really stood out to me when I first read the Isaiah Institute translation of this, because uh, I'd always read the King James, was this word crushed that he was crushed because of our iniquities and that that kind of seems strange to me when i first read it but it it makes so much sense to me now because he is who we are supposed to emulate in every way i know you've discussed in previous uh, interviews here how there are these different levels really of spiritual progression or regression and we're asked to have a contrite spirit, you know, a broken heart. And, a con and, and I realized, you know, as I, I've kind of started studying Hebrew now in my studies of Isaiah, that contrite really means to be crushed. It's the same thing. Um, Cameron, did you have anything about this that you wanted to bring out or that stood out to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um... One thing that, that comes to mind that I've thought some about recently is the idea that when you have a, a hierarchy, um, and, and maybe in this case, in the context of Isaiah, we talk about it in terms of a spiritual ladder, that the thing at the top of a given hierarchy or a kingdom has to embody the idea of self-sacrifice. Um, and the reason for that seems to be that that when it doesn't, things fall apart. And so maybe a, a couple of, of examples can help uh, us understand that um, if you have a boss or 
uh, there's a football team captain or uh, it could be a king, right? Or a president. And you don't get the sense that the person who has all of the power and is, is organizing you know, the team has their best interest in mind and is willing to sacrifice him or herself for um, their well-being, that things tend to fall apart. And so there's a sense in which Christ's atonement and the love and self-sacrifice that he exercises on a cosmic scale is sort of what binds and seals all of creation together. Um, and you see that reflected on, on lower scales as well. Uh, but Christ is obviously the greatest fulfillment of that. Yes, he is. And as we go in a little bit more later into some of the, the covenants and things that need to be renewed or made so that we can have this full restoration of Israel in the end times. Um, I think for me, one of the things that really stood out in, in my study of Isaiah was that we have to have this personal, like really personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ in order for these things to be fulfilled, um, which would actually bring us to the next scriptures so we can go on to that unless Abraham, you have anything else to say about this part? I'm sure, yeah. It's this is really an important part of Isaiah 53 because it um, mentions that he paid the price of our peace and that he with his wounds we are healed. And those two terms, uh, peace and healing, those two ideas or concepts are are key to the whole identity of who this person is it doesn't say in Isaiah that he's the Lord himself it just uh, it has word links to a number of instances of peace throughout the book of Isaiah other parts of the book of Isaiah and, and the healing and, that God's people experience and there's Jehovah himself the God of Israel who um, established his peace among his people in, in the world and it is he who heals his people. And so those wordlings establish the fact that this is indeed the savior um, of his people and, and their God, their, their savior God, who's, who's spoken of here. Right. That's what makes Isaiah 53 so unique is the language here, because really, honestly, throughout a lot of Isaiah, a lot of the verses that many of us perhaps thought you know as we had been taught isaiah based on old um paradigms that that it was jesus christ and many of them weren't many of them were actually referring to this end time servant but in isaiah 53 all of a sudden we have something very different it speaks about this person um in such a unique way um can you tell us actually maybe what what are some of the differences between the role of the end time Davidic servant as opposed to the salvific role of our Jehovah as our king and savior. Um, are, are you asking me? Oh, or, yes, yes, I'm okay. sorry. Yeah, so Jesus in the scriptures is never called a servant anywhere. Um, the servant in Isaiah, therefore, is not Jesus. And nor is the David, even Prophet Joe Smith in a couple of instances said, it's someone else. Um, and, um, and we've quoted those in our newsletters and continue to do so. For example, the servant uh, is appointed to be a light to the Gentiles. And Jesus has made it clear, both to the Nephites and to the Jews, that he's not called to the Gentiles. He's called to the house of Israel only. And so he has someone else, his servant, become a light to the Gentiles. He points him as a light to the Gentiles. And, and many other things like that, um, that indicate that the servant is a different person. In 3 Nephi 21, 10, for example, Jesus is speaking about his servant. He's speaking as Jehovah, quoting Isaiah 52. And he's speaking about his servant who brings forth the words of Christ. And those words of Christ, are yet to come forth from the large plates of Nephi, not the small plates that the prophet Joseph Smith brought forth. And that's a part of an end time scenario. So we have to be so careful uh, not to just accept what others 
say Isaiah means. We have to really search it out ourselves and use our minds to process through the evidence. And quickly we find out that, hey, the servant is the one who restores the house of Israel, the Jews, the ten tribes, and Lamanites before Christ comes and establishes Zion with the help of other servants. Um, that helps establish Zion among them so that then the Lord can come to Zion as he came to Enoch's Zion after Enoch had established it. And the more you look into this and the more you analyze what the scriptures actually say, not what you want them to say, or what you suppose they said, then you can come to truth, but you have to have an open mind and not rely on all precepts of men that have come down from, a, from an age of apostasy. That, uh, the, the plain and precious parts that were taken out um, you know, that we still lack, uh, we have to account for those. And, and this, is, this is the kind of thing that we find with Isaiah, where people put their own spin on it. Yeah. Yeah. And Cameron, I don't know if you had this experience. I mean, I've only been really studying Isaiah for two years, but I remember when I first started studying the Isaiah Institute translation, and it was so clear, you know, with these concepts I had never considered before, like a difference between Jesus in the Old Testament and the servant, I was like, wait a minute, there's two different people here. It's really obvious when you read the Isaiah Institute translation. Did you, uh, do you remember what it was like for you when you first kind of discovered that there were two kind of different people it was talking about or that Jesus was different than what you had thought before? Yeah, you know, initially it was a little bit hard um, to see it because I was looking at it from the bottom up and didn't have the whole picture in mind. Uh, one thing that's really helped me to make sense of a lot of it and understand it is the idea that um, as a servant or servants, after the order of the Son of God, uh, those who are following him and are embodying his truth and likeness are going to um, reflect in many instances the same uh, behaviors and patterns that he did. So things that, that he in fact did do in his life uh, serve as a pattern for those that follow him. And so while there are instances that uh, he applies Isaiah to his own day, um, you know, calling the Pharisees, say, a generation that their hearts are far from God, but, you know, they draw near to him with their lips, um, and he's a servant that's rejected by a people like that, that will be just as true for those in the latter days that uh, have grown into the full measure of what his gospel was intended to make of us. Yeah, and and so and that and that re oh go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I was just gonna say that understanding comes from a study of Isaiah when you understand the verses that very specifically state this prophecy is for the end time. And there are other applications, of course, because there's this bifid structure where you know there's sort of various levels, but yeah, it's definitely written for our day. And people who have been studying Isaiah understand that. Right, right, absolutely. And and I was going to say. I think what we see happening is, is Christ in some sense is being planted um, as the word of God, as a seed in the world. And when that comes to full maturity and it's bearing fruit, that's what the end time Zion and restoration of the house of Israel ultimately becomes. And so uh, we're mimicking in, in uh, a very real way, the very, very same things that he did. Um, and so we should fully expect to see those same patterns being repeated in the last days, especially uh, on the heels of his return. Yes. Abraham, did you have something to add there? Yes, I was going to say, it's the Lord himself, Lord Jehovah, the God of Israel, the King of Zion, chapter 52. He is the main character in the book of Isaiah. You know, he's the main person. Mm -hmm. And his servant is, uh, as Cameron has said, emulates him in suffering as well. And all his servants go offer their whole souls to Christ, which is an acceptable offering to him, to God. Um, but wherever it speaks about the Lord Jehovah in the book of Isaiah, that is a messianic prophecy in itself. It doesn't have to be Isaiah 53 or some other you know, prophecy like that. The book of Isaiah is full of messianic prophecies. The servant is his, the, the word servant and son um, are actually, you know, technical terms designating a vassal 
in emperor vassal relationships that help you understand Isaiah's theology a whole lot better and how it emulates and how it actually precedes even the gospel of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. It goes back way further um, because Isaiah has the fullness of the gospel in a very rich, from a he rich Hebrew perspective. So the term servant and son are now, Paul says the, the Lord took upon himself the form of a servant, but he's not himself that servant. His taking upon himself the form of a servant simply means that he became a vassal, a proxy savior vassal type of vassal under the terms of the Davidic covenant, like all saviors do. Um, at, after, you know, after, um, at, in other words, as ancient Davidic kings, um, merited the people's physical deliverance or temporal salvation. So he, he merited and, and won the people's, uh, his people's uh, spiritual salvation. So Jesus did the spiritual Jesus, salvation. Yes. yes, right. And, and speaking of which, in order to obtain this salvation and ascension to more of a, a Zion society, there's sort of a waking up that needs to take place among the covenant people of Israel, a, a repentance process for many. And that leads us into the next part, which would be in Isaiah 50 and one. Um, Cameron, can you go ahead and read that for us? Absolutely. Thus says the Lord, where is your mother's bill of divorce with which I cast her out? Or to which of my creditors did I sell you? Surely by sinning you have sold yourselves. Because of your crimes is your mother cast off. So do you, who is he talking about here when he's talking about your mother or you being sold? Either of you want to take that? Let's start with Cameron. Okay. Um, my understanding here is this is referring to the Latter-day Covenant people who have cast themselves off uh, by um, effect of their, of their own sins, that they've violated essentially the covenant, uh, the marriage covenant that they've made with the Lord and uh, consequently have removed themselves from that relationship. Right. This is that intimate relationship with um, Jehovah that I was talking about that um, many of us may not even fully understand. Um, what do you see here that you'd like to teach us about, Abraham? Uh, so, yeah, it is about the Lord's current people today, which are the Latter-day Saints. Um, and because Isaiah is, is an end-time scenario, even Isaiah 53 is introduced by a spokesman, spokesperson for verse 1 of 53, a spokesperson on behalf of his, his people who's saying, who has believed this revelation of this report? So, so he's, he's um, the rest of the book of Isaiah, except for that one thing, which is going back, you know, referring back to something that happened in the past from an end times perspective, is an end time scenario. And what's happening here in this verse is that the Lord's people, his wife, who are collectively the people of God, the common people of God today, have um, basically turned to other idols, the works of men's hands or the things of this world in which, which they've set their hearts and they've basically forgotten their, their mission, their end time mission um, to serve him and to serve as saviors to the other members of the house of Israel as their calling is. And so he's saying, well, you know, I haven't divorced you, where's your mother? You've divorced me, or you, you're you're drifting from me. So, right. so yeah. Let's go to the next scripture because it starts clarifying what this is all about. Yeah, sure. Let's move on then to Isaiah 54, and I'll go ahead and read this one. It says, "Seeing O barren woman who did not give birth, break into jubilant song, you who are not in labor. The children of the deserted wife shall outnumber those of the espouse," says the Lord. Um, so there is this theme throughout Isaiah. There are a lot of scriptures that talk about a woman giving birth and some people, um, covenant people, I'm assuming they can't even bring on labor or they just birth wind. They don't really 
birth Zion per se. Um, but here he's referring to someone who didn't even really seem to be in, in labor or anything like that. And yet somehow she birthed, which I find really interesting. Yeah. Abraham, what about you? What did you see in this verse? Well, those scriptures about from the book of Revelation and Isaiah 66 about the woman Zion bringing forth the male child. Those are in the next video that we'll be discussing those in the next video. Mm -hmm. um, but here, this is really, here in these two scriptures we, we're just reading, it's really about a switch from one woman to the other. So, so the Lord has two wives. Well, he had a first wife, which is the, the covenant people by lineage, like Jews, and the, whole, the house of Israel, that include the whole 12 tribes, uh, who today are, you know, their descendants are the Jews, 10 tribes, the 10 lost tribes, and the Lamanites of today, who are not lost to him. But um, they, you know, they apostatized, they rejected him, they were the first wife who rejected him. So, so then the gospel went to the Gentiles. And so they became the second wife, the current wife, a part of the Gentiles. We are, the Latter-day Saints are by definition in the Book of Mormon and other scriptures identified with the Gentiles. Um, the prophet Joseph said so in the, in the Kirtland Temple dedicated to prayer. We who are identified with the Gentiles, we're the Ephraimite Gentiles. And the gospel was restored to us, but in the end time, just before the coming of the Lord, we basically drift away. And we're the ones who go through the divorce. And so at that moment, the gospel switches back to the house of Israel. When the, Jew, when the Jews rejected it, it went to the, the Gentiles, now with the Gentiles as a whole reject, not totally, it goes back to the, uh, to the house of Israel. But just as the apostles took the gospel to the Gentiles, in their days, so some of us Ephraimite Gentiles take the gospel back to the house of Israel. <clears throat> and that's what this is about. So the woman who did not give birth are these people of the house of Israel who did not prosper. They've been under a co <clears throat> covenant curse all these years of exile and dispersion throughout the earth. But now the time comes when the, the Gentiles reject the Lord. And, and of course, that's that hasn't totally completed yet. But this is what Isaiah predicts for our day, for the end time. And so then um, those who, whom, she, whom she did bore, the children of the deserted wife, who are the, the, uh, the, um, the natural lineage of the house of Israel, we, they will far outnumber those of the, the currently espoused wife. In other words, the one that we are, become people of us today. So in other words, it's like, it's like the allegory of Zenos when Jacob 5, when the wild branches are grafted in, they bear good fruit for just a little while. And then they start bearing bad fruit till none of it is any good. And then when this, the Lord commands his one servant to gather other servants, who are the equivalent of the 144,000 servants in Revelation and the servants in Isaiah to graft in the natural branches, then finally the, the tree bears good fruit. And, and for a long, long time to come. And that would be the millennial age when Christ comes. So all these scriptures kind of reinforce one, one another. Isaiah, the Book of Mormon, and well, all scriptures together, all paint the same picture of Israel's restoration finally. And, and that's the way it kind of happens. It's a, it's, a, it's a switch over from one scenario to another. Right. And Nephi is very clear about that. He obviously was very concerned about what was going to happen to his posterity. And he talks a lot about how when that fullness of the Gentiles takes place, um, that basically there will be some, some Gentiles who do step up and do their part and help bring the gospel to his seed and help them to establish Zion. But it, he's talking really mainly about though how it's, it's Israel, it's the descendants of Israel who are the ones who who come in and, and are the majority that establish Zion and, and do that work. And I think just to add real quickly, he, he puts it so succinctly when he says uh, the gospel will essentially go from the Jews to the Gentiles and then from the Gentiles back to the Jews. And so we see sort of in that uh, chiastic pattern uh, what this is describing right here. Um, and I love in third Nephi, how Christ 
puts Isaiah 54 in this verse in context of um, the coming forth of the servant and his being rejected. And uh, due to his being rejected by the Gentiles, they're being cut off from among the covenant people. And so 3 Nephi 21 uh, depicts that scenario. And immediately following that, he talks about the Lord turning his uh, heart back to the Jews in, in some sense and uh, beginning to work among them. And then says, and then that which was quoted in Isaiah uh, will be fulfilled, which says, what we read here. Abraham, it's your turn to read. Do you want to read these? Sure. <clears throat> the Lord calls you back as a spouse forsaken. This is the house of Israel that was rejected anciently, the first, the first wife. Mm -hmm. Forlorn, a wife married in youth only to be rejected. Well, Israel was very young still then. I forsook you indeed momentarily, but with love and compassion, I will gather you up. You know, Israel has had a lot of experience in exile and dispersion for all these decades and centuries so it's going to be different this time they're going to get it i mean they're going to get understand what it's about in feeding his aspiration i hid my face from you but with everlasting charity i'll have compassion on you so the lord who redeems you and this is the word everlasting and charity it's a synonym of covenant in hebrew theology and compassion the same everlasting compassion everlasting charity and everlasting covenant um, everlasting mercy, everlasting peace, all of those indicated in a, a, a um, unconditional covenant after Israel has met the conditions for, for that. And the covenant with them changes from a conditional covenant to an unconditional covenant. And that's what, that's what Israel goes with into the millennium, into the millennium and, and, and that's after becoming a Zion people um, makes that possible. Cameron, what's your understanding of this unconditional covenant and like this where the Lord says, you know, that he redeems you? Um, well, in, uh, in the terms that Joseph Smith has used, and, and I think that really originate with Peter, it's to have one's calling and election made sure, um, which, is, which is to come up to the stature of the fullness of Christ and uh, I think to be filled and sanctified with the spirit to such a degree that... Um, that you embody, you embody his likeness. And that's what it ultimately means to be the servant or servants uh, who will bring about the latter day work. I'm reminded of the, oh, yeah, sorry. I was just gonna say, I'm reminded of the verse in um, Ether, the brother of Jared, where he actually sees Jehovah and he says, you are redeemed from the fall because you've come back into my presence. And ultimately, of course, that's what Zion is about, isn't it? It's, it's where, Jehovah will be. It will be people who can be there and be with him in his presence. Abraham? Yeah, I was going to say um, that it is the spiritual kings and queens of the Gentiles, as in Isaiah 40, um, 49, 22, and 23, who bring, who, who are the ones who restore Israel, the natural lineages of Israel. And, and this, these verses here are speaking about the natural lineages of Israel. But each of them who come back and who are restored to God's covenant will have to be will have to ascend to a celestial level. It's the elect whom they gather. Jesus also says in Matthew 24, he was sent as angels. These are translated beings, these spiritual kings and queens who gather the house of Israel, who gather the elect of Israel to Zion. So it, without us measuring up to perform that task, that role of restoring Israel this scenario cannot happen, cannot be fulfilled. All right, well, moving on to Isaiah 55. Cameron, can you read that one for us, please? Yeah. Give ear and come unto me, pay heed that your souls may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my loving fidelity toward David. See, I have appointed him as a witness to the nations, a prince and lawgiver of the peoples. You will summon a nation that you did not know, a nation that did not know you will hasten to you because of the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, who gloriously endows you. So, Cameron, um, do you know who he's talking about here, this nation that he didn't know? Um, summoning a nation he didn't know? Mm 
Uh, well, my understanding is that this would refer to the scattered tribes of Israel. Uh, is, this, is this in reference to the servant himself, uh, to whom an everlasting covenant is being made? And, and as he's, uh, say, coming from the Lord's people that, that he's bringing together and gathering these people he didn't know? I guess that's my, my best guess. I don't know for sure. <laughs> Abraham? Yeah, so the David is the Latter-day David, and um, he is appointed, and the word appointed is a word link to his appointing his servant in other parts of Isaiah. Uh, there's only one person who does the restoration, the individual, the servant and the David are the same person. Um, it's very clear. He is a lawgiver like Moses and a prince. He's not the king of Zion. He's, he is a prince as also others like, like uh, Ezekiel has called him. Uh, who, and they also talk about Israel's rest, end time restoration that he does. So the nation that he summons, you're correct, uh, Cameron, that is um, the same as Enoch's people. When Enoch went out preaching to seven nations, out of them came a people of God, and they became a new nation, a new nation called Zion. And so it is here, and they do come from all of the, the tribes of Israel that have been scattered and dispersed throughout the world. But they didn't know him. The word to know is um, a covenant term. Like he, he knew the five virgins, the wise virgins, but he did not know the foolish ones. So it's a covenant term that indicates that, hey, they were a lost and fallen people before they came together as a new nation of God's people called Zion. So now they did not know him, but they will hasten to him because he sent to them and God has empowered him and gloriously endowing him when he was translated. He is translated in the end and he's healed from his, from his marring in chapter 52. They mar him when they reject him. Uh, and then as if it's seven talks about the Lord healing him. And Jesus quotes that in 35, 21 where he heals him, quoting Isaiah 57, and quoting Isaiah 52 about him being marred, and then he's gloriously endowed, because then he has power like Enoch over the nations and over the elements and, and over any enemies that stand in his way. So this is an everlasting covenant or an unconditional covenant, his loving fidelity toward David. Now, other servant passages of Isaiah show, show the Lord's appointing him as a covenant to the nations or covenant to the Gentiles. So he in his person is a covenant or mediator of the covenant. He mediates God's covenant like Moses did to the house of Israel, to God's people at large that are being scattered abroad. So this passage is saying, you know, don't spend your money on, on stuff. Um, come, come to the Lord and then your souls may live. He'll make with them an everlasting covenant. This is a, a call out, so to speak, call out from among, from among the nations to become God's, to renew God's covenant with his people. And if you do that and keep his law, he will deliver you. And that is the nation, you know, that goes into the wilderness for a time. At the very time destruction comes upon the entire earth, they come in an exodus to Zion, which is a place of safety for God's elect. And so, yeah, that's basically what's going on here. Is it also possible because it is speaking in the plural at first that it's talking about how other people will receive this this unconditional covenant and become Davidic servants themselves? Um, it is a single it is a single person. Hmm. Of course, they all do the same thing. They all have stories, well, as in Zenos' allegory, the one servant calls the other servants. The, the Lord asks the other servant or commands the other servant to go and gather other servants to to do that. And of course, these other servants also exist in Isaiah. And they're also called watchmen and they're called, you know, um, kings and queens of the Gentiles, but they're also called servants. And in other scriptures, they're called, you know, the 144,000, saviors on Mount Zion and so forth. Yeah. All right. And so this is evidence essentially here of the Lord um, bearing his arm and um, the servants, I, I believe, are also called watchmen, which Let's look at this next one then. Um, is it Cameron's turn to read? I think so. Cameron, you want to take the long one there? 
Sure, I'd be happy to. Okay. Hark, your watchmen lift up their voice. As one, they cry out for joy. For they shall see eye to eye when the Lord returns to Zion. The Lord has bared his holy arm in the eyes of all nations, that all ends of the earth may see our God's salvation. Break out all together into song, you ruined places of Jerusalem. The Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. Turn away, depart. Touch nothing defiled as you leave Babylon. Come out of her and be pure, you who bear the best you who bear the Lord's vessels. But you shall not leave in haste or go in flight. The Lord will go before you, the God of Israel behind you. So is this speaking now specifically again to the people who are Israel? Is this speaking to the kings and queens of the Gentiles? I know it's sort of, there's like different groups of people that sort of are already there and then they bring in more. So who's he speaking to here, Abraham? Well, he's speaking to everybody. Um, mm -hmm. The Lord's bearing his arm. The arm is a person, is the servant of God, as we see in chapter 51, verses 9 through 11, in the eyes of all the nations, or the Gentiles even. Um, so he comes to prepare the way. His mission is universal from the get-go. Even when he's rejected, he's still sent to the, to the nations at large. Um, but he's rejected by God's people. Um, God's covenant people, which, which are the land of these saints, as we mentioned earlier. Um, there are different ways of translating some of these passages in here. Like um, the Lord returns to Zion or the Lord restores Zion it can be translated two different ways. The watchmen are those, you know, the servants of God who are then, um, who replace other watchmen uh, in chapter 50. Six, I think it is. Yes, chapter, the end of chapter fifty-six. There are other watchmen who are who are um, displaced by these new watchmen. These new watchmen being the Lord's end-time servants. And the, the reason that these verses are out of order here, in my translation or in the Isaiah Institute, Isaiah Institute translation, is because Isaiah fifty-two and fifty-three are juxtaposed with Isaiah fourteen. Uh, which talks about the king of Babylon. And this, these two chapters talk about the king of Zion uh, and his servant. Um, so um, the sequence could have gotten out of place, which often happens in the Masoretic text when the Jews had to you know, memorize entire books. And when the books uh, were, were burnt, they had to write it down from memory. And sometimes you know, they forgot a verse and then it would, pop it in later when they thought about it, but then it would be out of place. They, they couldn't cut and paste like we do today. They have to continue writing on the scroll. So then that became a, a permanent, kind of, permanent kind of thing. Well, anyway, um, this is talking about leaving Babylon, but Babylon is not explicitly mentioned there either. That word should be in, in, that, in parenthesis, <clears throat> as it is in my translation. Um, so, um, yeah, so this leads to an exodus, as you can see in here. They, they leave Babylon in an exodus, um, the elect do, and they, the, verse 12 is basically copying or repeating what happened in the exodus out of Egypt, out of bondage to the promised land. They did not leave in haste, but at first they did, but this time around it's not going to be. The Lord will go before you uh, and the God of Israel behind you. In the Exodus out of, Bab out of um, Egypt, <clears throat> it was the angel of the Lord who went before them. But this time, the Lord himself is going to go before them. So this is a beautiful passage that talks about, again, about Israel's end time restoration. Yeah, there's a lot of imagery here that reminds me of a lot of other things. But Cameron, what are you seeing in these verses here? Um, well, something, something that um, I think we have to remember is that what we're seeing here is the result of things that we, we read previously. Uh, so for instance, even in the last verse, we read of the servant being empowered to gather the Lord's people and that they'll all be gathered to him uh, because, because of this endowment, so to speak. Um, Isaiah 52, of course, uh, is the same chapter that talks about the servant being rejected and marred. Um, and a common theme that we see throughout the book of Isaiah, uh, 
uh, has to do with descent and ascent. So as the Lord's servants and servant uh, willingly and humbly submit themselves to the decent phases that the Lord puts them through, the suffering and sacrifices that they have to make, um, what's been called the fellowship of the suffering of Christ, then enables them and empowers them to rise up higher than they were previously. And in so doing, they're given more power with God than they had before. And that power allows them to draw and restore uh, that which was previously scattered. And so the, whether, it's, whether it's the watchman or the servant, I think the bearing of, of God's holy arm really encompasses all of that, uh, this empowerment of God's people to carry out this work. Right. And of course, that kind of empowerment, as we mentioned earlier, is going to be needed because they're, on one level, there's going to be this fulfillment of all of this prophecy of things that are just so catastrophic in a sense that have never been seen before. But on the other hand, there's going to be this um, restoration and this uh, rescuing also that is also unprecedented. So I'm reminded of Jeremiah, what is it? Um, Jeremiah 16, 14, yes, Jeremiah 16 where he talks about, you know, people will no longer say the God who brought Israel out of Egypt, right? Even though that's what Isaiah often references. Um, but he's saying, you know, they're going to talk about the God who, who did this, who, who brought us out of Babylon. And um, the incredible thing is that we get to be a part of that. Many of us who understand this um, also get to help and provide essentially um, a savior role as we do what you said, Cameron, which is have that willingness to not not only endure um, certain things, but endure those things on behalf of others. Um, to play, you know, to perform a role where we're willing to um, intercede um, on behalf of other people in certain ways to help provide that protection for them. I don't know if you wanted to elaborate on that, um, either of you. Well, I might say this is part of why the Lord's people go one of two ways and either rise up to this calling to become saviors or become as salt that's lost its savor, as it says in uh, section 103. And that harkens back, of course, to the birthright of Joseph, which is to be a savior to the house of Israel. Um, you know, after he went through his own descent phase, he humbly bore that and as a result was empowered Um in his case, in a political sense, but of course, the Lord is behind that. And in our day, uh, it's it's really, it was a type for what will be a spiritual fulfillment, um, which will then, you know, allow us and empower us to go out and uh, and do that work. Mm -hmm. Abraham? Yeah, and that is all, this is Sherman said, that all happens within the terms of the Davidic covenant, which is a covenant of a proxy savior, what it means to be a proxy savior. And you see it in the Book of Mormon, in the brother of Jared, um, mm -hmm. who called, when the Lord chastened him for not praying, he said the Lord, brother of Jared repented of what he had done and, and called upon the name of the Lord for his brethren who were with him. And that is that intercession you just talked about, Dustin, that is part of being a king and queen of the house of Israel. And if we don't know that role, we will never be able to perform it. And it's just something in name only, and it has no effect. But if we understood the terms of the covenant, of the Davidic covenant, we would see that role very clearly. And we could rely on it totally because the Lord will come through for us when we perform it. There's no doubt about it. Just like Jacob said of Nephi, unto whom you look at, unto whom you look as a king and a, and a protector on whom you depend for safety. Because Nephi would call upon the Lord daily and nightly for, on behalf of his people. He served, them, he served the role of a king, even though he, they did not call him a king. He didn't want to be called a king, but he served the role of a king. And so did Moses. When, mm -hmm. when the Lord wanted to destroy Israel for having worshiped the golden cup, Moses interceded and said, take me out of the book of life. He was willing to go back and start all over again in his life, basically. Uh, and but his intercession, he had power with God because of his sacrifice. 
then so do we. We, have, we. we build up a bank of merit that has power with God to, um, to deliver others. And, and we have been given so much of Latter-day Saints. And if we don't fulfill it, if we don't perform that, we will indeed be assaulted as lost its savor, as Cameron just mentioned. That's in, from the Doctrine and Covenants. We have two choices. What I, uh, what I love about that is that sort of kingship, um, you know, that willingness to descend and, and to suffer with on behalf of one's people is so emblematic of Christ um, to kind of take it back to, to where we started. Um, I think it's worth noting that every, every instance that I can think of in the scriptures where one's calling an election is made sure takes place in the context of their interceding for and suffering on the behalf of others. Um, it's never a, it's never a selfish endeavor. It's never, uh, them going out to seek their own enlightenment independent of service in, uh, in the Lord's priesthood, as it were. Right. That just seems to be the pattern of the, the gospel generally and, and blessings is, it's, it's more of like a, a looking outward kind of a thing um, on behalf of others with everything. And as we do that, as we sort of um, let go of our own will and our own desires and just seek the Lord's will in, in everything, um, as we seek to you know, help and lift other people up, we're just sort of naturally elevated, I guess you could say, as part of that process or invited in. Um, to partake of these these covenant blessings and and things like that. Um, the way that the way that I think about it, um, this is an image that helps is is uh, that of a tree, because a tree, say a branch on a tree, uh, and this is actually, I guess, I mean, I didn't come up with this. Christ came up with this in John fifteen, when he says he's the true vine and we're the branches, and and if we're connected to him, essentially, that will bring forth fruit. And so there's there's this imagery of us receiving and giving simultaneously. And uh, I think that's, of course, connected to consecration, but that's, that's ultimately how we receive and come into a fullness of God's blessings is we orient and we orient ourselves and our lives in a way to uh, then spread the light that he gives us. And so, you know, it's not like we're just here to receive, but we become a conduit through which his light can flow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, Abraham, as people go through and they study this part in Isaiah and they're learning about these covenants and all of these things, um, what do they do? How do they go forward from here and, and continue, to, um, continue to develop this relationship you know, with Jehovah where they, they see eye to eye and, um, and um, fulfill their roles in these last days? Yeah, I think we have to purge our lives of all our idols and um, in this world and turn our hearts and minds to God. And the book of Isaiah is a great place and a really important and significant place. It's a deliberate challenge to search it, not just read or study it. And when we do and, and incorporate those, those principles and the, the knowledge we gain in our lives, and as we learn then to connect and to understand other scriptures better that because I, as you understand Isaiah, all other scriptures become more transparent to us. Um, and, and we can see our role and a lot of it just depends on our, on our commitment. We, we have to give up lesser laws in order to keep higher laws. And Isaiah's ladder to heaven concept in the seven levels in Isaiah, it's all about that. We have to give up a lesser law on the lower level and, and we start observing higher laws and higher levels. And we go through our descent phase of being tested and tried every which way, offering up our afflictions to God. And then we are reborn spiritually and we're given new names and we are, go beyond salvation to exaltation and different degrees of exaltation. It's all a, such a beautiful program. It meshes, in, Isaiah meshes entirely with the performance of the gospel. It is the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it's so subtle, it's so, um, it's ingrained in the entire book of Isaiah and in God's covenants, the, the Sinai covenant, the Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, they're all there. If we understood them, then we knew how to act. We knew how, 
what God is asking of us. And, and as we then do what he asks, then he starts empowering us. Um, even in the midst of all kinds of evil, evil, evil has to run its course uh, and get to the ultimate evil that it can possibly be so that God can then empower us over it. And that is what happens with translated being. Forever we're going to get translated and fulfill these, fulfill these missions of, of servants of God that restore the house of Israel. We're going to have to go all the way into the, into the depths of suffering even. But that's the key. That's the entire key to being a proud of God. It's a glorious, glorious program. <laughs> we can't really emphasize it enough to say, hey, learn, get Isaiah. Isaiah is, is the key. Is the, he is the prophet of the end time. Mm -hmm. Has Isaiah helped you, uh, Cameron, to clarify sort of your understanding of um, your role or your relationship with Christ? Has it opened your eyes to things? Oh, without a doubt. Um, Abraham has said, uh, maybe he said, or has quoted other people who frequently say that uh, studying Isaiah is like a reconversion to the gospel when it begins to open up to you. And I think that's true uh, for so many of us. Oh, um, absolutely, yeah. And that was absolutely, yeah, the, the case for me. I found that he was sort of, uh, his writings and, and understanding the prophetic patterns that he was talking about were the central key that unlocked everything. Um, you know, in, in terms of the scriptures and the gospel. Uh, and, and in some sense, it's like it said in chapter 29, it, it really is a sealed book until we take the Savior's invitation to search it diligently. But uh, as we do, you know, the invitation is there to, to unlock it in some sense. And, and, and then everything else is connected and, and the Book of Mormon starts opening up in new ways and uh, all the pieces sort of fall into place. Um, you know, Latter-day Doctrine and and uh, well, I guess I should say restored doctrine, um, but it, it all has a perfect place in this system that the Lord has ordained, and it's mapped out beautifully in the book of Isaiah. Yeah, that's absolutely been my experience, too, and I actually remember when I first really started studying Isaiah, because someone who I knew, who I considered to be a pretty much a spiritual giant, posted um, the Isaiah Institute translation of, I believe it's uh, 58, the one that talks about obeying my fast and my Sabbath, right? And he posted this and I read it and I understood it. And I was like, wow, I understood Isaiah. That's amazing. Where, where is this from? I inquired as to where this translation came from. And, and I started, you know, with chapter one, studying everything. And, but I kept going back to 58. Isaiah for me has been such a, a personal journey. And I know sometimes when we learn these things, we have a tendency to want to like tell everybody else how they need to go about doing stuff, <laughs> which can be a bit of a rabbit hole that you go down. But for me, I just kept going back to that, to, am I right with the Lord? Am I right with the Lord? Is this, am I where I need to be? And I feel like if people approach Isaiah with that in their hearts, um, it's just, it's amazing. It's like, God was like, Jocelyn, I've been waiting for over 40 years to tell you these things here. Let me just, and every time I would read Isaiah, I would start receiving more personal revelation and more personal revelation. And it was like a reconversion. It was like reading the Book of Mormon for the first time. It, it is just this whole new level now of uh, understanding and a relationship with Jesus and understanding him in ways that I didn't before. So I'm just incredibly grateful for that, um, of course, Abraham, for the work that you've done in um, bringing this to us in these last days so we can have that and being able to work with um, both of you uh, on, in, this, in this good work that I feel that we're doing to help other people. So any last comments before we wrap this up? Abraham? Well, I, I hope and pray that many people will come to Isaiah in our day and uh, learn what the fullness of the gospel is all about not just the basic principles that we all subscribe to but there's a fullness of gospel here and and those who accomplished those great miracles in the book of mormon uh, in the new testament they understood these truths and they applied them in their lives and they were they paid the price for it and then they could do those miracles and god is the same yesterday today and forever he's no respecter of persons we can and should and will some of us at least according to these prophecies, need to accomplish that. And, and, and yeah, that's yeah. how it's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, as it says, even in just in this 
I believe, is it in 52, um, that that kings and queens will see things they had never considered, you know, will be shown things that we hadn't ever thought of before. And I know that Isaiah has definitely done that for us. So, well, thank you for being with us tonight, Cameron. It was a joy to talk with you and see you again and Abraham as well. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks so much, Jocelyn. Okay, bye. Thanks, Cameron. Thank you, guys. Okay.